Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Harish Malkani, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for SESME. And uh, we are here today to bring you another webinar uh, in the series that we have named the Nth Degree of Smart Manufacturing. Um, the purpose of these webinars is to provide you with a little bit of a deeper understanding on specific subject matters that are important to the world of smart manufacturing. Um, and uh, also to bring a, a uh, visibility to some of our experts in, in the network uh, for SESME. Uh, today we are very honored to have Dr. Satish Bukapatnam. Uh, he is the Rockwell International Professor and Director of Manufacturing Systems Institute at Texas A&M University, and we are happy to have uh, have him talk to us today about intelligent machine tools for smart manufacturing. Uh, so with that, um, uh, Satish, if you'd like to maybe introduce yourself. Absolutely. Um, can I share my screen? Uh, yeah, again, thank you so much, Harish. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, are you able to see my screen? Um, yes, we are. Yeah. Um, today, uh, let me begin by providing a brief introduction to uh, what uh, our research uh, portfolio is all about, and then uh, the background that I bring. Uh, as you have uh, rightly said, I'm a faculty member at Texas A&M, uh, serve also as the director of their Institute for Manufacturing Systems. And uh, broadly, in the last 25 years that I have served on the faculty at uh, the University of Southern California and Oklahoma State, besides a and uh, our group has been focused in the area of uh, smart manufacturing, broadly defined. Specifically, we have been pursuing some fundamental challenges at the nexus of uh, manufacturing science, essentially precision manufacturing and uh, data science and artificial intelligence. And uh, our research has always been focused on creating innovations to address some of the quality assurance as well as productivity issues in primarily automotive, aerospace and microelectronics industry. And again, I'm very glad to be part of this uh, deep dive conversation and look forward to the remainder of uh, our conversation, Harish. Great, thank you, Satish. So, you know, the topic today, we've called it uh, intelligent machine tools for smart manufacturing, right? So when I think about the, the word intelligence, right, that can exist at uh, various levels in, in that ecosystem. You know, it can exist at the device level, it can exist at a machine level, it could reside at a flow path or a line level, it could reside at a plant level, at the enterprise level, right? So so could you speak to us about why, why intelligent machines are important for that smart manufacturing ecosystem and, and how they fit into that uh, landscape? Absolutely, Harish. Um, let me try to talk about the issue of why we need intelligent machine tools as we move to the next frontier of smart manufacturing. Uh, the first idea that I would like to share is the uh, disruption that is imminent in the entire manufacturing ecosystem, uh, which uh, is currently is being called as transformation of manufacturing into a service. The idea here is to be able to make products and deliver qualified products on demand and move it from a traditional, very centralized manufacturing enterprises to a more democratized and highly distributed manufacturing enterprises. The idea here is uh, very similar to the disruption caused by Uber in the transportation arena. Uh, so when this democratization or Uberization of manufacturing is being conceived and being talked about in various different forums, one of the key ideas that uh, comes to the fore is uh, things related to machine tools themselves. 
fundamental among these actually relates to uh, how machine tools are used to fulfill the demand for a product, just like the automobiles are used to fulfill the demand for transportation. Right? And uh, again, taking a step back and ask and think about uh, why Uber has been successful um, in the way it delivers the service at the quality that it offers. Uh, it, because of certain advantages a car currently has and uh, a machine tool still does not have. And mm -hmm. in that context, we have been thinking in terms of three different imperatives. So Satish, when you, when you talk about, if you go back to the previous slide, if you talk about the manufacturing as a service, right? I mean, there are some, uh, some manufacturing sectors that are sort of natively suited for, for sort of a digital delivery, like additive manufacturing, right? But I'm assuming that, that when you say manufacturing as a service, it actually applies broadly to, um, to the other sectors as well. So you could have conventional manufacturing processes that are part of that that uh, manufacturing as a service ecosystem, correct? Indeed, Harish. In fact, if you think about it, uh, overwhelming majority of uh, manufacturers around the US are small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. And uh, or again, a vast number of and majority of their machine tool platforms are not yet additive manufacturing machines, but they are comprised by various conventional machines that you're seeing on the slide. They could be consolidation processes, part of the foundries, or it could be machine shops, or it could be finishing centers, what have you, right? So we need to go beyond uh, just looking at uh, what is uh, uh, being thought of as the revolution from additive. But the key here is how do we fulfill the customer demand? And to be able to do that, you need to execute a process chain. One machine is not going to accomplish it you need to have a uh, shop floor consisting of multiple machines over which you have both information as well as material flow with which you accomplish it. So the quick answer here is uh, uh, absolutely yes. We need to think beyond and above one process, either additive, subtractive, but we need to be able to capture the ability of a small and medium enterprise to be able to deliver value and be able to capably produce the product on demand. And of course, uh, there has been uh, some evolutions happening in the machine tool arena too. And there has been discussions about next generation or generation next hybrid machine tools that can somehow encompass multiple such operations into a single platform. And uh, there has been uh, major uh, thought trains about uh, trying to develop these hybrid machine tools as a suitable platform for the next generation or the emerging small and medium enterprises, especially for the innovators who want to be part of this democratized manufacturing paradigm. Right, right. Right, so, uh, but there has to be a few additional things. Just having a machine tool hardware or the platform is not sufficient. It's just like having the car without the app for uh, which Uber has become very famous for. Uh, first of all, three things we need to focus on. The first one is uh, the equipment or the small medium enterprise should be capable of fulfilling the demand. So in other words, equivalent of uh, being able to follow a map to be able to address a particular transportation or here a manufacturing requirement. However, uh, the ability to execute such complex process chain becomes a challenge. And that actually becomes a smart manufacturing challenge that we need to help the small and medium enterprises with. Second imperative is uh, would a particular manufacturer be available to be assigned this job for producing the part? So the issue of reliability becomes to a uh, uh, very important consideration here. So this is very similar to how the drive matching happens in the transportation sector. 
in order to be able to do that, we need to develop some sort of a provenance and the ability to forecast uh, some sort of downtimes of various equipment, availability of a manufacturer and their resources. And that can happen only if different data elements are fused together across a plant and beyond perhaps to be able to address this challenge. And uh, the third uh, imperative is it's to say that it's not just sufficient that a manufacturer is capable and is available, but also we want to make sure they can deliver a qualified product. In order to be able to deliver a qualified product, we need to have an inbuilt and uh, robust quality assurance system built. And it's very similar to uh, how we have this drive experience in the transportation sector. Uh, however, instilling this qualification capability into a machine tool uh, requires us to go beyond the traditional and be able to come up with a new smart manufacturing tool that can de detect defects and any kind of pro product anomalies so that uh, you have a clear qualification happening at the source. And when the product is delivered, you have some assurance of value. So these are all the three imperatives that uh, we have been thinking about. Yeah, so uh, a couple of, couple of things just came to mind as you were speaking, Satish. One was that I think you used the word machine and manufacturer a couple of times. So what I'm assuming there is that when you say, can it do the job, You you it could be both levels, right? Can the machine do its specific job? versus can a small manufacturer in a larger supply chain do its job, right? It's, it's at both levels. And Absolutely, the, Harish. Shades, Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, if you think about this, these machines are essentially part of a larger cyber physical and uh, human in the center system of systems. That's how the entire manufacturing enterprise is evolving. Okay. And the more we connect them, we are looking at a system of systems here. Right. So, I think what uh, what I was thinking beyond just what what you just said is that okay, you you also said uh, connect, and what I'm thinking here is that in addition to the the imperatives that you've listed here, it's absolutely important for the machine or the manufacturer in the supply chain to be aware of what's going on, right? Be yes. self-aware, and second of all be able to communicate if you're a machine then the ability to communicate with other machines in that in that uh, flow path and if you are a a uh, a particular plant in the larger ecosystem then your ability to connect as a plant from one plant to another perhaps right is that is that also sort of tied into some of these these imperatives that you're talking about Absolutely, again, uh, Harish, in the sense that uh, these imperatives have to be in convergence with the larger IT as well as communication issues. Absolutely. And convergence of these operation technological challenges with IT is essential to properly give value to our small and medium enterprises. Uh, right. So essentially, the idea here is we need to connect them and connect them in a very cost effective as well as efficient way. Absolutely. Right. So, so how, I mean, you know, you said, okay, why is this is important? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you'll now go into telling us, well, there you go. <laughs> what exactly do we need to do? What do we mean by, by smart machines? Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, the idea here is, uh, Hopefully, we have some kind of a teasers on the uh, the value of having a smarter machine mm -hmm. and uh, embedding intelligence into these machines, and also some sort of a new generation of a machine. And uh, what I I will try to present here is one version of what can be a intelligent machine tool, and uh, how this uh, intelligent machine tool can help with achieving some of the imperatives that I spoke about. And this initial version essentially is uh, uh, based on uh, what is called the idea of um, uh, smart hybrid machine tool. And um, 
this essentially combines additive machining, finishing, inspection into a single platform. And uh, the idea here is you can print various kinds of materials uh, at small volumes of any free forms. And you can actually finish it to the not just farm to the functionality and uh, uh, study the whole process flow into a single platform. And uh, while you are actually making the part on this machine, you have a lot of sensors like uh, measurement instruments embedded into the machine so that you can collect data while you are actually processing the part and making the part. Mm -hmm. And this ability to sensorize as well as create a proper data ingestion pipeline will help make this machine to a smarter machine and come closer to delivering on some of the imperatives I spoke about. Mm -hmm. Over just mere uh, installation of sensors and data ingestion platform is not going to be sufficient. You can create fantastic dashboards where you're actually visualizing various data that one can collect from various sensors and measurement instruments from the machine too. But unless we have a way to harness this information, we may not be really delivering value to our uh, manufacturers. Let me elaborate on that part also. Essentially, the message here is we can actually come up with advanced machine tool platforms. We can sensorize them effectively, but we need to go beyond to be able to deliver value. And here, what we have is uh, the various data streams that we can obtain from the machine tool. Uh, here, you're able to collect simultaneously vibrations, forces, temperature, and simultaneously you can go and then watch the machine through a high-speed camera. And again, by applying some advanced learning techniques, as well as pattern matching techniques, you can associate and synchronize all data sets. So in other words, you can start interrogating uh, the uh, entire process by asking questions such as, when I'm observing some unusual pattern in my forces, what exactly was happening in the process and what exactly was happening on my product. So such type of uh, complete uh, association can be uh, used and uh, developed and used for detecting anomalies on the, in the product. Essentially, you can look at uh, defects and you can work backwards by looking at the sensor data to look at the root causes. And similarly, you can use the same data sets to be able to look at the process related anomalies to, for example, if uh, you're looking at a 3D printing process or a welding process, you can look at the spark patterns to tell if there is anything anomalous about uh, the heat, the energy sources or anything related to the materials and so on. So the ability to fuse this information to be able to address some of the quality as well as uh, machine uh, reliability issues, I think is uh, very valuable and it's an imperative that we need to be thinking about. And uh, there has been a lot of studies that uh, have uh, showed or at least uh, showed through certain use cases that significant increase in the output as well as reduction in costs are possible through the use of such provenance enabled through this uh, sensor fusion. So Satish, when, when you were talking about sensor fusion and, and the fact that you have many, in, in this case, you know, you have three, three sensors from which you're getting the, uh, the data, but the more important facet of that is that you're taking the three signals and then deducing from that something else, which is greater than some of the parts, right? That it's not simply looking at the three signals independently, but you're forming some um, some conclusion or developing some insight because a subject matter expert can take a look at the three together and say that, oh, this means that there is an impact on something in the part or something in the process, right? So that that's what actually makes it truly intelligent rather than just having a sensor and a signal available. 
Absolutely, absolutely, Harish. In fact, that is the key here. Uh, essentially, we need to learn to fuse the domain knowledge that we all have in the underlying manufacturing as well as material sciences mm -hmm. and marry it with advanced AI and data science ideas so, so that we can actually look at the data to context and thereby effectively address some of the challenges related to detecting defects or identifying faults in the process or maybe take a much higher uh, effort in terms of uh, looking at entire asset management management of your equipment and plant and so on so uh, the the key as you nicely put it is how we could combine some of the domain knowledge with data to be able to address and identify the various nuances of the process exactly harish right sure. so tell us how then how do we actually make them intelligent what are the pieces that are necessary Sure. Again, let me uh, give a couple of facets. Um, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, there has been a major uh, efforts to insert different kinds of technology as, as part of our manufacturing operations. Uh, and uh, whenever we try to insert a new technology, for example, we are trying to modify the material systems in a microelectronics industry, or we are trying to in insert a slight advancement in our automation into a particular high volume production environment or we probably are looking at uh, changing one aspect of a machine to the other so essentially going from gen 1 to gen 2 of the same machine to uh, platform and so on or investing in altogether new technology like ai uh, and uh, additive manufacturing so whenever there is an insertion of a new technology one of the first thing that uh, industry sees is uh, the results of uncertainty that actually leads to some quality issues that need to be ironed out. Many of these don't take much long, but they usually take significant effort of the industry to kind of uh, retune the process after every technology insertion. And uh, that challenge often can be costly for small and, small and medium enterprises. How do we deal with these challenges in light of some of the fantastic advancements that are taking place in the imaging and sensing arena, especially in the context of smart manufacturing? Right. So if you look at uh, some of these imaging techniques, there have been a lot of in-situ measurement uh, technologies that are uh, becoming extremely available. To give a quick uh, folklorish thought here, the camera that I have on my smartphone is 10 times, smart, 10, 10 times more powerful than the cameras that I happened to use as a PhD student some 25 years ago. Sure. And, right? And they're becoming very inexpensive too. In fact, uh, the, uh, the cameras that I had to use uh, as part of my PhD experiments were about $200,000. And uh, smartphone cameras, a few hundred. So essentially a huge cause differential is happening. And uh, these imaging technologies are being pushed into the industry. And uh, the resolutions are also getting to be much better every year. And what they offer is the ability to be able to capture these uh, defects that are, taking, that are occurring on our parts uh, and that are becoming extremely important as we insert newer and newer technologies. So new tech, uh, so but there is a small issue though. Whenever we insert the technology, insert these technologies and start seeing defects, although we have fantastic sensors available, there is not many labeled data. So in, you don't have a dictionary in place that tells you uh, when you see a particular image, you are seeing such and such kind of a defect. And uh, it's also in the manufacturing domain, it becomes very expensive to run experiments whereby you can collect this data and build this dictionary for every new process and every new material. So uh, the lack of this so-called label data actually becomes a major constraint 
to applying the traditional machine learning approaches with this uh, advanced image. So sensors are available and you have fantastic images, but you don't have sufficient data to be able to invoke some of our state-of-the-art deep learning and other methods. So, so Satish, if I may just interrupt one second, when you said labeling is a, is a, a challenge, is it at um, it, it, maybe maybe two different uh, interpretations of that, right? So one is that when you're trying to classify a defect, right, you're still dependent on a human to come in and say that yes, this is good, this is bad, and that becomes a label for that that particular uh, uh, observation. Yes. Uh, but the other one, which may or may not be part of what you were uh, alluding to here, is that for any AI or ML driven technology to work well, the information that is being fed to that technology needs to be in the proper structure, right? And that structure can only be created uh, through an input from you know humans and subject matter experts is that fair that's uh, it's not just fair harish that's exactly what it is for most of the uh, learn con con conventional machine learning techniques are almost always passive they use these supervised learning paradigms and uh, the key to any successful and deployable supervised learning is availability of uh, what I called as label data. Mm -hmm. In manufacturing domain, the label data is essentially a data that is well annotated and uh, basically structured into a proper input and target format for the whole uh, machine learning method to learn well. Uh, so uh, to make this uh, point further, it's easy to collect data. It's easier to probably deploy these sensors too. But the challenge actually is in being able to uh, create proper annotations with these data to be able to uh, carry forward some of these machine learning techniques and thereby detect defects. So that is the key challenge. Here. Yeah, we, we talk about context, right? I mean, that's that's uh, super critical um, in, in, in these type of applications. So data without context is not very helpful, not very useful. Yes, absolutely here. And of course, there have been a new branches in uh, modern artificial intelligence and machine learning arena. There have been a recent uh, spurt uh, of innovations through active and unsupervised learning methods. Mm. And let me give a quick glimpse of one unsupervised learning method that we were able to deploy here in this context for detecting defects in uh, in situ using some of these advanced imaging methods here. Uh, the method that uh, we talk about uses the idea of a graph. Uh, in the top left corner, you see an image. Um, imagine that it's not completely labeled. It's just a pure image. Uh, but any image that you see here is basically filled with many patterns. And it's basically a composition of these motifs and some motifs are closer to each other in the way these patterns look like and so on, right? So what these individual uh, motifs across the entire image will lead to is it allows a graph representation where you can think about each motif or each uh, pattern that you see in the image as a node. And you can look at any pair of such patterns or the nodes and say how similar they are. And based on the level of similarity, you connect a, uh, an arc can to uh, bind these two uh, nodes together. So essentially what you have is a bunch of nodes all over your image, represent, each representing a particular motif or a particular uh, uh, pattern and the node that connects any of these two patterns is actually uh, is basically the similarity of these patterns and uh, an interesting uh, idea here is when you actually have an image and build these types of patterns 
it usually with certain uh, quick clever manipulations it usually allows what is called a planar graph representation and using this planar graph representation you can actually come up with a way to classify each node uh, as those belonging to usual and those belonging to unusual so you don't have to have an a priori labeling but you are actually using the entire node structure of this graph and segmenting the graph out to partition out portions that are interesting or likely defective and uh, this intuition was used to develop a method uh, that can capture the key segments out of your image uh, very quickly using a simple energy type of a metric that you're seeing on the right hand side and it turns out it's much faster and much more efficient than some of the supervised learning uh, methods for detecting these uh, uh, unusual patterns in the image and um, it's probably better way better than many of these uh, early stage unsupervised learning techniques and it's not just about being able to detect but also it's about tracking how these defects are evolving under different conditions or over time so this graph representation can be used not just for looking at landmarks in space but also you look at, you can look at the patterns that occur over time and then bind them together in this, in this form of a graph representation. And it actually leads to a quick, uh, as well as uh, sometimes very effective uh, way to pat isolate out defects or at least some interesting patterns without the need for any label. So whatever data the industry produces, we can still be able to use this technique to be able to isolate uh, landmarks of interest and uh, maybe provide a defect count and uh, def definitely make these sensors that much more powerful. So a couple of thoughts, Satish. One was around whether this sort of analysis and computation is number one, done in real time. And if so, then are we talking about bringing that type of computing power lower and lower down to the, to the sensor and the device and machine levels? Um, so that, that if you maybe want to respond to that particular point before I state my second. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, real time here is of the order of uh, a fraction of a second to maybe an order of a second. Mm. And uh, those things uh, uh, can be done now with the available computing capability because much of uh, the computing actually takes place for what we call is uh, uh, establishing some sort of uh, landmarks and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in terms of overall computations for an image processing type of a technique, if we do it in edge, that is embed the whole intelligence into the machine too, you probably are looking at a fraction of a second to be able to detect these defects. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, if such capability is not possible, given this local computational limitations, um, these applications could be deployed in the cloud. And uh, as we transmit the images, these images can be processed through the entire data ingestion platform that we will have as part of the smart manufacturing enterprise. Mm -hmm. And uh, these could be processed um, at various echelons of the network. So. Quick answer here is uh, it would be wonderful if we have the computational power to embed this intelligence, in which case you can detect these in real time at the fraction of a second rate. Um, however, if we have to uh, deploy the, our cloud-based applications, it still is feasible and the real time would be at the order of a few seconds. I see. I see. I can see. I mean, you know, it with with at least the the world that I came from uh, in in metals processing, um, uh, image analysis and and assessment of surface quality on metal parts, right? That that's that's that was like the next frontier because to do that in real time would provide such immense benefits in terms of 
you know, process improvements and process control. So I think the fact that we are getting to the point where cameras are getting cheaper, image analysis has become possible, computing has become possible at, at the, the, the lower end of the spectrum in, in terms of, you know, where it, where it actually occurs. Sort of, it gives me a sense that what was perhaps not possible 10 years ago in, in surface inspection and surface monitoring in real time would now be possible, right, based on what, what you just stated here. So. Very much so, Harish. In fact, uh, uh, not just imaging, but the sensor technology also has become a little bit more affordable now. And yeah. you can actually start detecting defects yeah. by using information from multiple kinds of sensors. Um, however, as you nicely said, it's we are not at a point where a defect detection system that was developed for a particular context is completely interoperable across various different manufacturing platforms. Sure, sure. Right? But what we have been looking at is the idea of a sensor wrapper mm -hmm. that basically looks at the context um, and uh, basically delineates this context in terms of uh, the time requirements, basically what kind of latencies uh, need to be worked into the system, what kind of spatial as well as time resolutions we would need to have to be able to make decisions and work backwards from the decision needs into the analysis, essentially in terms of what kind of machine learning approaches can be deployed as well as data analysis of methods could be deployed to be able to deliver and support these decisions. And then backwards to what type of uh, uh, data acquisition as well as manipulation pipeline, as well as sensor schemes should be in installed to be able to enable these decisions. And we call this entire uh, scheme of uh, thread of uh, analysis, data acquisition, manipulation, and sensor suite as a sensor wrapper. And we need to think through uh, developing such sensor wrapper ideas uh, peculiar to every particular manufacturing domain. And I think that is what will enable uh, the broader applicability of these techniques and uh, making them perform well in uh, other industry context beyond what these have been developed for and tested for. Yeah, and particularly if you can if you can carry that forward in in a fashion that you're not recreating a lot of work, that you have modules or building blocks that can go from one use case to another with little, uh, I would say, not customization, but more like configuration uh, or training perhaps in, in, in this case. I think that that would be very, very useful, of course. So. Great. Absolutely, yes. Essentially, the, the, the customization or basically uh, configuration modification would be in the form of making a few specific adjustments mm -hmm. on, to match the time, quality, as well as contrast needs uh, for every different application. Absolutely, Harish. Great. And uh, so that's one capability that we have been able to uh, build up within our group. Mm -hmm. The other uh, one that I would like to also talk about is uh, the kind of uh, uh, methods that we can deploy to enhance the asset management um, in, as well as machine tool uh, reliability assurance in small and medium enterprises. And I think it becomes uh, very interesting and pertinent uh, considering the amount of data that gets generated these days in the across many plant floors, right? Um, the industry is definitely moving into installing various kinds of plant floor information systems, and uh, have been uh, there has been significant growth in the manufacturing execution systems and other such plant floor platforms. And also, there is a serious growth that is anticipated in the Internet of Things. So there is a huge amount of uh, data that's going to uh, be part of any industry's asset structure, right? And this data, uh, I mean, less than 10% of this data has uh, been put to use in any kind of uh, modern industrial context. 
uh, and uh, studies suggest again that uh, predicting uh, the I mean, using this data can help with predicting falls and uh, looking at ca their causal mechanisms so that you can prevent some of the major breakdowns from occurring. So you can actually use this data to assess and possibly improve the reliability of your entire manufacturing uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right. And also you can use this to improve your yield because you know when you will be and when you will not be available and then plan your maintenance and all of those, all other programs across the plant floor. And it's also becoming more important because uh, when you are trying to deploy these smart tools into your plant floor, you are somehow connecting your equipment to the network. So uh, since the entire manufacturing uh, operations and enterprise is going to be highly connected, you want to make sure uh, a breakdown is properly monitored and then possibly prevented because it will have much higher ramification in a highly connected system uh, instead of when it is not. So the challenge here is how can we use the data that gets generated and that's becoming extremely uh, abundant across uh, many manufacturing enterprises to be able to detect these breakdowns well before they happen so that you have a chance to prevent this. And we have been working on this idea with the leading automotive uh, uh, firm and uh, the use case that I'm going to show is basically a 20 machine um, manufacturing line of a automobile manufacturer and uh, they're actually using some sort uh, using this type of a uh, structure to make certain important component uh, and they have a plant floor information system that actually recorded the historical information of when each of these machines uh, were available, the faults that they actually incurred. Actually, we had uh, over two years of data was stored. Uh, and we didn't have to use two years, essentially a few months of data is sufficient to come up with a very good idea. But what we were able to do, it was very surprising to us that uh, this AI can deliver this information. The history, historical data had the information buried in it to be able to predict an impending breakdown of a machine um, half an hour ahead hmm. to a very high accuracy. And of course, the errors creep up as you start looking at from half an hour to one hour and all the way to your shift. But uh, if we are able to combine the history of not just this machine, but all other machines across the system, we were able to somehow find a, an enormous improvement in our ability to predict that. So in other words, you need to understand how the material as well as the information flows in a typical manufacturing environments and somehow build this idea or understanding of uh, the manufacturing operations with what we are actually able to glean from the data. And if we do so, we will be able to predict way ahead. And uh, this was a very surprising result when we actually saw it. We had to verify it multiple times, but it turns out to be very, very intuitive um, uh, that we were able to predict uh, at least uh, half an hour ahead. And uh, if we kind of work a little bit harder, maybe even longer. And it's not just sufficient to have this machine learning approaches but it needs to be delivered in such a way that the stakeholder can understand. And what any of these prognostic methods will provide you is what is called a hazard function that captures the risk of a machine breaking down. And you need to be able to create a visual picture of how these hazards have been predicted relative to when the actual machines broke down for each of those past scenarios to be able to deliver. So we have a way to quantify those. And more importantly, it's instead of just predicting these breakdowns, we can actually basically provide a quick graphical view of what may have caused the breakdown of a particular machine or what's going to cause the breakdown of a particular machine. It may have to do with a flawed part entering from a different machine. 
or it may be due to the issue that a particular machine has some anomaly and because of that the parts that that machine produces introduces an anomaly in a downstream machine or some such methods some kind of a root causation for these impending anomalies will help us uh, target our repair plans so these are all some of the ideas that we could definitely build in again uh, even in this scenario you're somehow combining your domain expertise of how these uh, machines work how they are connected how the product or the material flows through these machines and how the information actually is controlled across this machine and then marrying our domain knowledge with data to be able to deliver good predictions and it can be improved further by adding more and more powerful forms of data but even with the existing uh, conventional data sets that most of the manufacturers keep a log of uh, it's possible to develop uh, advanced ai tools that can provide such values for improving their assets so so it seems like you know when we when we talk about making machines intelligent um, and and providing intelligence to a manufacturing operation uh, that we could insert that intelligence at, at different levels like we talked before that you could you know you could have it at the device or the machine level but in in this example you are actually collecting information from perhaps a series of smarter machines bringing it to the next level and then that's another level of intelligence that you're adding um, at, at an operational level right um, but the the harder you work at bringing some of the basic intelligence and communication pieces in the individual machines, the better off you will be at the next level is, is the sense I'm getting, right? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Essentially, there is a complete, just like a data pipeline, you have to have an application pipeline also so that you are actually building on the value that you accrue from lower level to higher level. Absolutely, Harish. And I would think that as you're doing that, what becomes important is not the fact that the machines are intelligent by themselves, but the fact that they can communicate to the other machines and the other levels in the organization in a form that is structured and repeatable, right? So that you can leverage multiple applications to the same data right, the same information that you're getting from the machines. And yeah. this is where I think when we talked about the context, right, so as we develop intelligence, that intelligence has to be working on data and information that is already contextualized so that it becomes repeatable, right? Absolutely. Uh, indeed, Harish. It's not, uh, again, it's not just about making sure uh, we are able to transmit data of course, data can be transmitted, and then that's a simple or elementary form of communication we can establish across machines. But this intelligence that you build into these machines enable a higher level of communication. Instead of just transmitting data, they are actually, machines are transmitting what we call as more actionable information across the network. I think that actually enriches the entire platform, and that's also uh, leans out the entire platform. Basically, you are uh, essentially transmitting only the more valuable information. And as a result, you're making uh, the whole pipeline much more efficient and clean. Great, great. Well, this has been a great storyline. Uh, I mean, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, why is it important to have the intelligence uh, embedded in the machines and, and what are the ways in which you can do so. And uh, what is also pleasing to see is that a lot of these techniques are not just for some of the advanced manufacturing operations, but also for uh, for many of the conventional pieces. So um, let's uh, close it up with some of your closing thoughts and, and takeaways. Sure. Let me quickly summarize, Harish. Um, yeah, yeah, essentially, as you nicely said, uh, the entire manufacturing uh, community has been looking at ideas to transform manufacturing into a service. The key motivation behind this is to be able to enable small and medium enterprises take advantage of this emerging digital threat. 
And uh, one of the key imperatives here is to uh, empower our uh, small and medium enterprises with uh, intelligent equipment that can actually take advantage of various applications as well as advances taking place uh, in the smart manufacturing arena. And uh, any of these equipment and resources should actually have three ideas built into it. The first one is they should be capable of executing a process chain so that they can actually be able to fulfill any kind of a demand or a customer need. And uh, second idea is if these are embedded with these sensor wrappers, essentially have it heterogeneous sensors, imaging instruments, as well as embedded intelligence, they can actually be much more powerful in the effect that uh, they are not only capable of fulfilling a demand, but also they are available to fulfill the demand and be able to uh, fulfill the demand with highest uh, quality metrics. And in order to do that, again, uh, we need to go beyond convention. It's not just an AI problem, or nor it's a, a pure manufacturing challenge. It's actually at the intersection or the nexus of our deep understanding of the manufacturing processes with innovations in AI and data science. Uh, for example, uh, one idea that uh, we discussed is uh, going beyond the conventional deep learning and introducing new kinds of unsupervised learning methods to be able to detect defects as they occur, especially when you have uh, new technologies being introduced. And second idea is uh, taking advantage of our domain understanding to look at the data from a totally newer lens so that you can actually do things that, uh, such as uh, being able to detect breakdowns well in advance. So these are some uh, interesting ideas as well as interesting possibilities uh, which will have severe, I mean, serious impact on the industry that can emerge from looking at uh, AI in the context of manufacturing. And again, um, this whole uh, ideas that I shared with you, Harish, uh, wouldn't have been possible without uh, the work of my students, uh, Bhaskar, Asif, Zemo, and Afrin. And uh, the material that I shared with you is uh, from the sources that uh, I have presented here. Again, thank you so much, Harish. Excellent, excellent. Well, this has been uh, certainly very, very educational for me personally, and I'm hoping that for, for our audience as well. Uh, so I want to thank you, Satish, for being with us today. I know there was a, a great deal of work that went behind this, and, and thank you to your team and your students for, for uh, helping expose it uh, to the SESME community. Uh, so thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing this with us and 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 providing your insights. Uh, with that, we will uh, close this webinar off. And uh, if the audience has any specific questions, um, uh, they can certainly contact uh, Sesame, and we will uh, help uh, get in touch with Satish and, and his team uh, if there are specific questions. So again, thank you again. Thank you, uh, Harish. For the rest of the day, stay safe and be well. Thank you, everyone. Bye.